Uh, Kathleen Scott is a 12 year master gardener, but a 20 year wildlife gardener. She has created large and small habitat gardens certified by the National Wildlife Federation. In the process, she's made almost every mistake possible, making us, making her one of us, right? <laughs> because we've all made these mistakes. Learning the hard way how to design habitat gardens for birds, the plants that grow here, how to grow them, and what not to do. Her articles on habitat gardening have been published in the San Antonio Express News, and her wildlife gardening talks draw, uh, draw folks from all over Central Texas, and she came highly recommended, so we're excited to welcome uh, Kathleen Scott today. Can I just add one thing real quick, too? Sure. She did provide us with a couple of handouts. And if for some reason you forgot to print those up beforehand, they are available still on our website. So you can go back and print those up later. Right. Okay. Okay, so I'm getting a message that says host disabled participants. Okay, screen let me. Okay, see if that did it. All right. Yes. Okay, can everybody see? Yes, we can see. All right. I am so tickled to be with you guys today um, <clears throat> because everybody has a passion and mine is wildlife gardening. Uh, I believe in nature and I believe in doing everything we can so that uh, birds, bees, butterflies, and wildlife flourish. And as a result of that, I love talking about it. I know some folks think that public speaking is a chore, but I think it's a blessing because then I get to preach. It's not really preaching though. And I should have called this program, anyone can create a hill country bird garden. And, and uh, how do I know that? Well, I'm glad you asked because I came from Florida and uh, 15 years ago, I'm almost a native I, now. I came from Florida where you could dig with a spoon in your backyard and it rained every day at three o'clock. And so if you can trans transition from that to an inch of clay over limestone and a wardrobe of pickaxes, then you can, and a place where in one year you might only get nine inches of rain, and you can, you, anyone, can create a wildlife garden. So um, she did a good job on my introduction. There's just one other thing I want to tell you, which is I took pretty near all the pictures in this program in my own gardens. And the one that you'll see the most of was in conditions very much like Kerr County. It was on the, um, on the west side of I-35 up into the Hill Country Park. So you'll recognize these plants and you'll recognize the, the habitat around it. And with that, we'll get going. Oh, one last thing. Take a good look at that picture there because that's the part of the garden we'll be talking about most. And in the center, you see a pile of rocks, which is actually was a beautiful waterfall and a place where I used to see hummingbirds dueling out in the, in the summer mornings for who got the best spot to take their baths. It was so much fun. But you'll also notice um, that there are lots of different kinds of plants and that there are lots of levels of plants. And so as we go through this, that'll be something for you guys to think about because down the way, we're going to get to a picture which shows you what that ground looked like when we bought that house directly from the builder and there was uh, nothing there except big trees. Okay, so the te why do we see birds here? Well, the Texas Hill Country is one of the birdiest areas in the entire nation and you can look at that picture of one of the migration routes 
to see why that's the case, 420 species live here, migrate through, or are here seasonally. So why do they love it? And I got to tell you, I got to take that picture from a helicopter and that was so much fun. In the far back of it, you can see a little sliver of blue, that's Canyon Lake. And then you'll see the Guadalupe River coming down from that. You'll see riparian environment, trees all the way along the lake. You'll see fields that have grasses and crops. And you'll see residential homes where there are bird feeders and so there's a lot of different habitat. So you add to that that we have a year round climate here. In the summer, we have a lot of species that come here to breed. And in the winter, we have a lot of species that come here to eat. Those sparrows and birds from up north will come down here and eat our seeds because it's warmer here even in the winter then it's going to be anywhere close to them. And then there's the migratory paths that we saw. So we're going to talk today about um, why, and I think we've already seen a bit of that, and what and how we're going to, we're, this is a preview of your program. And I want you to know that first you're going to learn a lot about birds. And you might think, well, gee, we're in this for the plants but you're in it for the totality. You learn about the birds so you know who they are and what they like and how you can draw them in and how you can support them. You learn how to design a garden that is really good habitat, what the principles are for that. And then you get a sampling of some plants. And I would love to make an all plant program, but A, your seats would, would your bottoms would fall asleep from the amount of time we sat there and B, nobody would remember it anyway and, uh, and it'd take up too much time. So it's a sampling, but it's a sampling of all kinds of plants. So let's get going here. And in this picture, you'll see on the left, the bird on the left is a painted bunting, male, arguably the most beautiful bird in North America. And the painted bunting families come here to the hill country to breed in the summer. And on the right in that uh, bird bath, you'll see a little fluffed up and fussy female cardinal. And I want you to note that that bird bath is just an old plastic saucer with water in it and rocks so that it's shallow enough that the little birds can use it safely sitting on the ground. You don't have to have fancy stuff to take care of the birds. And if you can put some water on the ground as well as in elevated places, there are birds like these that'll appreciate it. So our year round birds. Well, there we are again. There's our uh, female <coughs> cardinal and the yellow flowers there uh, in that picture are six many daisies, which I don't think are in this program, but are, are really in the plants you'll see, but are a really good source of seed and really hard to kill and deer don't eat them. So if you're looking for something that will take living in road base or living in part shade, that's a good one. Now, all these other birds are year round birds and you'll know them. You see cardinals, you see Carolina chickadees, you see black crested tip mice, you see wood houses, scrub jays, you see some of all of those if you're looking. And then we have the summer residents that we've talked about. Most of them come here to breed. And the one you see in this picture is a male summer tanager. It's the only solid red bird in North America. So what a delight to have them. Now the female is yet yellow and they're about the size of a cardinal. Their favorite food is bees and wasps. And you'll learn why that's important to us in how we garden a little later on. And uh, also the black chin hummingbirds are, are uh, nesting in our region and they don't have a huge nesting area like um, ruby-throated hummingbirds. Ruby-throated hummingbirds nest all the way up into Canada and all the way across to Maine and all the way down into Florida, whereas 
Um, the black chins go up through Texas, Oklahoma, uh, east in Louisiana and Arkansas, and a tiny bit in New Mexico. So um, there are much many fewer. I want to just also mention, you'll see on that list golden cheeked warblers. Those are endangered and probably most of you know about them because their habitat is um, the great big ash junipers, also known as damn cedars, and we'll talk more about them later. And then we have winter residents, sparrows, orange crown warblers, eastern phoebe, and others, and that's a chipping sparrow in the picture. And I want to just quickly say orange crowned warblers are little drab, nondescript, gray green birds. And you will never see that orange crown just about unless you get to see one bathing or unless one is very alarmed. But if you stick with me to the very end on the last slide, there is a picture of an orange crown warbler showing his orange crown so you want to hang around and the migratory birds. And you'll be interested to know that they vary in spring and in fall. In other words, um, some of them go south through here, but they don't come north through here. So you've got to keep an eye out. In this picture is a male Baltimore Oriole and that plant, which is also not in this program, but everyone who can get one should get one, is big red sage, Salvia pinstemonoides. And I'm sure y'all know the story about that, so I won't go into it because we've got a lot to cover, but I do want to point out there are, you see those red tubular flowers? Oh, hummingbirds will so fight over these. And then you'll have the other birds that come for the seed. So it's what I call a twofer plant. And it has an evergreen basil rosette. How can you not love a plant like that, evergreen through winter? But you do have to fence it from deer. Okay, so how to have a house bird list to brag about. And so for any of you who say, all right, I'm going to, I'm all, all in. I already have native plants. I can do this. I want to have a house bird list of 106 species. You put your bird, you put out bird baths and feeders in an area with trees and easy sight. And the bird baths are really important because water is the most important thing. The birds can live without your feeding them. They can find seeds in other places, although particularly in drought times and tough times, cold times, um, it, it's helpful to them to have that. And you will see more of them if you do feed them. And then around your bird bath area, but not right up on it, you plant bushes and small trees because the birds want to have a staging area. They want to fly into a place with cover, look around, make sure it's safe, and then fly into your, into your birding, uh, your baths and your food. And then you wanna keep your bird book and your binoculars on the table, and you wanna look at the birds, write them down on your list, and then the most important thing, don't lose it. So the basic three things that birds need, they need safety, they need food and water, and they need shelter and or nesting. And we're gonna explore all those things. And you probably guessed the first one, which is no outdoor cats. Because even fat, slow, lazy cats catch ground feeding birds. You think about if you have a low lantana in your yard and it has flowers or um, a Texas betony, which is a low grower, and a hummingbird comes down to feed on it, it's, it's in easy cat range. And there are many others, penstemons and others. <coughs> Excuse me. So no cats. And I'll give you a hint for what we did. I love cats. I have two cats. They're indoor only cats. And what we did when we, when we learned about this and we brought the cats indoors full time, they used to be in and out as they wanted. And the cats weren't very thrilled about it. It's, we established what I call kitty TV. 
Kitty TV is a designated entertainment area right outside the windows. There were feeders, there were waters, I have that little plant garden. So there was always something for the cats to see and they could sit in the windows and act to their heart's intent, uh, heart's delight. The next one is no pesticides or poisons in the landscape. And the reasons for this are obvious. Um, and by the way, that is a Carolina wren and it's holding an insect in its mouth and you see the blow up on the left. And it's because it was taking that to its babies in the nest box that was on my porch. And so even, um, and wrens are primarily um, insect eaters and bug eaters and caterpillars, soft body spiders, those kinds of things. But most birds, if not all birds, feed those soft bodied critters to their young. So if we don't make sure that there are larvae, caterpillars, and soft bodied critters in our yards, there won't be anything for the birds to feed their babies. So that's a big deal. Um, and if you spray poison indiscriminately in your yard, then there are risk of birds being poisoned. And last, you'll kill off the good bugs as well as the bad bugs. And nobody wants that. And this bird in this picture is a lark sparrow and he's sorting through some leaf litter and mulch looking for bugs. So how do we have a healthy garden if we're not gonna poison it? Well, the first thing you do is you compost. And um, you compost twice a year if you can. That helps to keep your plants healthy. It helps to keep your soil good. It helps to nourish everything. Uh, and it can even uh, reduce your watering needs. And you mulch because that reduces weeds and it insulates the roots and it gives the bugs a place. And finally, good bugs help to keep bad bugs in check. So if you've killed off all the bugs, then you don't have that um, mechanism in your yard. You don't have a, a good, healthy, thriving ecosystem. So food and water. The most important thing as we've talked about is fresh water. And the bird in this picture is a golden fronted woodpecker. And if you look at that um, water, really carefully, you'll see that it's actually ice. That was in the winter, it was frozen, and there's one little spot where the woodpecker had pecked a hole in it, for which all the other birds were really thankful. So um, pretty much all the birds would come to this. And that's the best place to get to see the more shy birds that you wouldn't get to see otherwise, like yellow-billed cuckoos. So change water every day, clean your bird bath regularly, and as I mentioned before, keep the area right around the bird bath clear because that'll keep cats, snakes, and other predators away from the place where the birds are vulnerable. And then here's a couple more kinds of water. There's a little fountain on the porch and running water will really attract them. And then on the right, you'll see that same um, saucer we saw before, but this time there are cedar wax wings enjoying it. So how to feed. And the big deal about feeding is, and I'm gonna tell you that we're not gonna spend a huge amount of time on feeding. We could spend more, but we're not going to because we have plants waiting for us. Um, the more variety of feeding that you do, the more kinds of seeds and such, that you feed the more kinds of birds. And seed mixes are okay with one caveat. Avoid the ones that have wheat and milo and corn because those are more filler than food. So you're paying for something that's not beneficial to the birds. Many of the birds won't eat it. And so, and those mixes are cheaper. But if you look for the ingredients, pay a little more and it'll do really well. And the birds you see in that picture on the left are a morning dove and on the right is an Inca dove. And the Inca doves are fairly local to Texas. 
So you won't see a lot of those and you won't see them all over the state. They're really fun to, to catch a glimpse of. And by the way, I think at this property we had, we had seen four species of doves. So um, here are the different kinds of seeds. And I believe you have a handout on feeding birds, feeding birds 101. And it talks about the different kinds of feeders and it talks about the kinds of seeds and a little bit about which birds. And I, so I'm just gonna tell you a couple of things, which is safflower seed is the white kind, squirrels don't like it. So that's a really good one if you've got squirrel problems. Also, painted buntings do like it. And so do your common birds like cardinals, chickadees, finches, um, tit mice, and have I left anybody else? Oh, probably not. Um, Niger or thistle is goldfinches. If you really want to see goldfinches, and those are goldfinches in this picture, you feed Niger or thistle, and you have to get specialized feeders for that. Oh, and peanuts in the shell if you want scrub jays, which are generally now the ones in our area called woodhouses scrub jays. Okay, so you can also just throw your seed on the ground and that's a flock of chipping sparrows. And the only thing I'm gonna say about this picture, besides that that's a male cardinal on the right and chipping sparrow on the left, is you see that thing over the top of it, that little uh, hat shaped thing that is generally sold as a squirrel deterrent. Well, it's not a squirrel deterrent. It won't deter any squirrel. We all know squirrels are one of nature's finest engineers and they can find a way around anything. But what that will do is it will cover your feeder and your seed. And in the rare times when it does rain, your birds will really appreciate that. Also, it'll keep your seed dry, which is a good thing. So um, this slide we're gonna talk about mostly for hummingbirds. And hum I have a whole program on hummingbird gardening because it's different and there's a hummingbird feeding section on it. So this is really just brief. The ratio of sugar to water is one to four. And if you can boil water, you can make hummingbird food. Boil the water, put the sugar in, stir it until it's clear and it's done. And you can make a whole quart or however much you need or and more at a time, stick it in the fridge so you don't have to make it every day. That hummingbird that you see there is a rufous hummingbird, and they are here in the hill country more and more in the winter. So typically, you will see rufous hummingbirds starting mm, mid-December to end of December and leaving pretty much almost to the day when the black chin hummingbirds arrive which here in the New Braunfels area is someplace between March 10th and March 15th. So they might be a day or two later where you live, but they're coming kind of soon. And that means everybody get your feeders out because it's cold and it's going to be cold for the rest of the week. And you want to have your food out for when the hummingbirds get there. All right. So now we're getting to shelter and nesting. <clears throat> and we're gonna talk about how you attract more species. So the first general principle is you want multi-level gardening. You want low things, you want medium things, and you want taller things. And the reason for that is all these different kinds of birds. There are ground birds that really want to feed on the ground and some of them even nest on the ground, such as quail, and spend most of their lives on the ground, like turkeys. And then there are birds that like um, shorter, dense bushes for their nests. And then some of them want big trees. So you wanna have some of everything. And that includes native grasses, ground covers, wildlife, mulch, and you can see all of that in this picture. So um, bushes and small trees. 
dense foliage helps to hide the nest. Now, that's not a native plant, it's native someplace, it, but it is a pomegranate tree. And I don't know about you, but I give a pass to anything that I grow stuff to eat. I figure I am entitled to the herbs I cook with and the figs I grow in my yard or the pomegranates. Regardless, the principle is you want in your, in your medium sized bushes, and this is dense. And you want big trees. Now, if you just bought a new house in a new development, what's the likelihood that you have big trees? Oh, very small. So you're gonna have to plant fast growing trees and you're gonna have to take good care of yourself so you can live a long time. Having said that, many people do have large trees and we need to do everything we can to preserve them because bigger birds need bigger trees. Uh, great horn owls nest in the very top of the tallest tree in the area that is their territory. And hawks and owls also like tall trees, typically. And just a one little factoid to go with that, you probably already know this, but live oaks will support 110 organisms, up to 110 organisms, more than any other US plant. So there is a lot of habitat in having just one live oak. Not to mention that they're evergreen. And the last is something that we don't think about keeping much and that's dead trees. Now, why would we want a dead tree? Well, as they decay, insects come to them and then birds come to the insects and cavity nesters will hollow out holes like woodpeckers and, and owls. And so if you have a dead tree that's far enough from your house and your car and your neighbor's car that you can just leave it, give it a try. It doesn't hurt anything. You can even try growing a cross vine with it. And um, it'll give you a, a, a twofer kind of place. So here are the other principles of bird garden design. And we are back to the same picture that we saw at the beginning. And it's a little bit closer and you can see that waterfall a little bit better. And you can see some of those various kinds of grasses and plants. The real key to the drawing, the providing for the most wildlife possible is diversity. Diversity, diversity, diversity. So as many different kinds of plants as you can, I'm gonna add a, a caveat to that, which is just one little one of each kind of plant ends up not only looking like a mismatch, but it won't really attract the critters. So when you, when you do your planning and your design, plan on three or five or something so that you have a mass. So you have a mass over here of something, maybe a matching mass on the other side of something, of the same thing. And then when you look at it, you have balance and your, your um, birds can find what they're looking for. So as much diversity as you can do, low, medium, and tall, as you can get in. Planning also for as much as you can year-round blooming, fruiting, and seeding. And the reason for that is that you're giving habitat. Also, don't we all want to have at least nine-month blooms? I mean, isn't that so much fun to, to explore and see what's blooming today in your garden? The, la the third thing on here is something that you actually have to have probably some space in order to have. Those of us who have town lots may not have room for a thicket, or if we do, it's a small thicket. But you can have a small corner of a backyard with a yopon holly. It will make its own little thicket there in time. It's evergreen, it gives shelter year round, as well as giving um, berries and there are other plants that will that will go through to do that so 
a, a thicket will give you year-round shelter and then evergreens. So now we've, we've gone through five different principles and I'm going to hold up my hand and count them off. We went through um, multi-level gardening. We went through diversity. We talked about year-round um, interest for you and for the critters. We talked about a thicket if you can do it, and we talked about evergreens. And here we are to that garden at the beginning. There we are at the end, and here we are at the beginning. So this was actually not the beginning. This was many hours of pickaxing uh, from the beginning because we had dug up all those rocks that lined all those paths and wheelbarrowed all those pebbles to build those walkways and built a bunch of planting areas. But you can see that it was still um, very much a work in progress. And when I did the planning, I knew what I wanted to see and I knew what I didn't want to see. So if you have an area you're renovating, think about what you really want. Do you want a water feature? And what you really don't want, what I really didn't want in that picture on the far left, you can see behind where the pile of rocks is, those, those little thing, those round concrete um, tops going to the back. Well, those were the aerobic septic system and I did not want to see them and I did not want to hear them either, which is why I told my husband for my birthday, I wanted him to build me a waterfall. And then in the second picture, which is 2008, you can see that um, we had been really busy and that my husband, bless his heart, had built me a wonderful waterfall, which the birds immediately took to and loved year round we had bird interest and the painted buntings came and bathed there and so did the golden cheek warbler that was here in the summer and raised a family and so you can see that there are various kinds of small plants because they're small when you first plant them and then on the right is 2010 so it's only three years after 2007 to really pretty much a fully, a fully planted out garden that was functioning and thriving and attracting all kind of wildlife. It didn't really take very long. Now we were fortunate. That lot had a lot of large trees and that is a great starting area. But also we put in water, we put in all kind of plants, we made it appealing and safe and they had a lot of different areas that they could go to. And this is how I know anyone can do it because we had just come from Florida in 2006 when we did this and I did not become a master gardener before we did this and oh man did I learn the hard way. And so now we are finally going to get to our plants which is why you thought we were coming to start continue to do this program to start with. So the first ones are grasses and if you pull out the plant list that you got this will help that help you to check off any plants that you look at and say oh wow I'd like to have that in my yard. You'll remember it and you'll have the common name and you'll have the scientific name. I want to encourage everyone that you only buy by the scientific name. Why is that so? Because there are many plants that have the same name and are not even the same species. And firebush is one of those. So, for example, so you always want to buy by the scientific name. So this is little blue stem grass. And it has four seasons in interest because in the winter it is beautiful and golden tall and it provides some habitat and it's not only seeds, but if you leave it up and you don't cut it until the spring when it's growing season has started, then also the birds can use it for nest material as well as winter shelter. 
and Sidote's grandma. And Sidote's grandma is another four season interest. It's green most of the year. And in, um, in warm enough winters, it can even be evergreen. By the way, it's our state grass. And if you look at the picture on the right, you can see the little seeds that are hanging down from the stem. That's why it's called side oats. And this is a very drought tolerant grass and a nicely behaved little bunching grass. You can establish a whole bunch of bunches of this and it's a pretty little area. It doesn't spread by underground runners, it spreads by seeds. So will you have more of them? And the answer is, if you have a nice mulched area, yes, probably you will get more of them. They will receive themselves. If you don't want them, you can dig them up and pot them for your next native plant sale for the Native Plant Society. Now we're gonna to move to annuals. There's only one in here in this program, but there are um, many annuals. And my very favorite annual is not in here, and that is standing cypress. I'll just tell you, it is in the hummingbird program, though, and you can invite me back. I'd be happy to give that one. So this is a lesser goldfinch we're seeing on a sunflower that has gone from bloom to seed. And there are lots of kinds of sunflowers, so we didn't list a, um, we didn't list specifics here, but there are also some perennial sunflowers, such as Maximilian. And I was so tickled to hear that coral honeysuckle is uh, your, your nice plant of the year this year. This is coral honeysuckle, Lanacera sempervirens. And I really want to encourage you to be careful when you buy this, not only that it's Lanacera sempervirens, but it's not a hybrid. Why is that? Because the hybrids, although they may bloom more, have, have typically smaller flowers with less nectar, they give the birds less and they are less attractive to the birds. So you want the old fashioned original um, native coral honeysuckle. And um, it will grow really pretty fast. Now you remember that waterfall that I asked my husband to build me for my birthday? Well, the following year I told him I wanted an arbor for my birthday. And after he built this arbor, and uh, which included we had to have a concrete bench and included the, after I had that, well, I needed to plant a bunch of August sage around it to disguise the fence I put up because if you don't fence the bottom of your coral honeysuckle deer will eat it. Um, he said to me that he was used up for building me things for my birthday next year. He would like to take me to the jewelry store. So on we go. Um, we're moving now to fruit and seed trees, and these are American robins, and they're in our dry creek bed. You see all those berries? Ash juniper berries, also known as damn cedar, depending on where you live and how bad your allergies are. But there are a lot of berries that eat those birds, that birds eat. And here we have a thicket of ash juniper on the left, and you can see a berry on the tree on the right. So the moral of the story is, if you are a good ways away from any ash junipers and you want one in your yard, plant a female. They're the ones with the berries. Don't plant a male because the males are the ones with the pollen and the pollen is what bursts every tree on its own time so that it goes from mid-December through mid-March and never quits in that time period. So you don't want the, you don't want that in your yard. You're going to get plenty of pollen on the wind to fertilize your berries in your yard. But if you have them, don't just cut them all down willy-nilly. One last thing, 
about ash juniper. I mentioned earlier that it's an important piece of habitat for the endangered golden cheek warbler. It's the really big ash junipers with a uh, trunk circumference, I'm thinking bigger than 22 inches because the bark is friable. And what that means is that it, it, will, it can be peeled off in strips. When it gets to a certain age, the bark becomes friable and the golden cheek warblers will pull off little strips of that and they will use that bark to weave their nests. They don't particularly nest in ash junipers. That's not why you need them. I mean, they will nest in, in any nice little dense tree. I had them in a Yopan holly, and we'll see that tree later on in the program. But um, when I found the nest, it was beautifully woven from, stip, from strips of the front yard. So that is another reason to be careful of what you cut down. Okay, fruit and seed trees moving on. This is an escarpment black cherry and it's a little one because I plant one everywhere I move and this one hadn't been planted that long. I had already killed one, unfortunately, uh, in the drought of 2011. So this was after that. But uh, escarpment black cherries are great trees for all of you who don't have big trees, and I said, you plant one that'll grow to be big, but it, you want it to grow fast, they grow fast. You put compost on them and um, treat them right and water them when they need it, and they will grow. And pre it doesn't take that long for you to get a tree that is um, four times your height. And to me, that's a big deal because some of the trees in this program are going to take a whole lot longer than that. And this tree has blooms in the spring, which will, once it's a little more mature, has blooms in the spring, which attract butterflies and bees, and then it will have um, berries. Now you see it's fenced. If you don't fence that, the deer will take it. Mexican plum. I don't know about you, but this is one of my favorites because, oh my word, is that not the most heavenly aroma right about now as they're blooming in the spring? It's just wonderful. I don't know if they're blooming where you are, but I do know they're blooming in Austin, which is north of us. So it shouldn't be long before yours bloom. And I do hope this coming freezes don't inhibit that. Um, and these are good nesting trees as well as fruiting trees. So I would also fence this when it's young, if you plant them. It <coughs> grow tall enough so that the deer cannot reach their heads up and eat the leaves off of it. And by the way, the, one of the reasons I keep talking about deer besides the fact that I lived where they were is I also give a program on limiting deer damage in the landscape um, which is one I would be happy to give you whenever you are interested. Mexican or Texas redbud, one of the early blooming plants. Down here, they're just uh, trees. They're just starting to come into bud right now. And when they bud depends on what the weather's been. But these really depend on this tree early in the season when it's still cool out. So this is a great one to have and it's fast growing and it also will grow in part shade. In fact, it will probably thank you if you plant it so that it doesn't get in the sun. And can I mention that someone's mic is on and I keep hearing noises? Okay, the next one is one of my all time favorites. This is Possum Haw Holly, which is the burying est holly in Texas. Don't we all want winter interest in our yards? Don't you want to have something really pretty to look at when everything is kind of brown and bare? You need a possum haw holly because after those leaves fall off, those berries just look like they shine. And not only that, they typically stay on until February, March-ish because those berries don't 
taste good to the birds until they've had a certain amount of freezing. They don't turn sweet. You'll know when they turn sweet because one day you will have berries and the next day you will have a flock of cedar wax wings for three hours and there will go all your berries, but you will be happy because you'll know that spring is not too far from that. And if I were planting one of these, I would fence it from deer until again, it got uh, tall enough so that they couldn't reach up and eat, eat the leaves. Okay, I have a confession to make. This is a Brazil tree. They're wonderful trees. That's not my confession. My confession is I put this in here because I moved to a new place and I want one. I want one and I am hoping that one of you wonderful native gardeners have a small one that has, has uh, started someplace in your yard that you don't particularly want that you would invite me to come up and dig. I want one. I, I have had them. That's where the pictures came up. They're wonderful trees for wildlife. If you look really closely into this Brazil tree here, you can see there is a male red cardinal up in the top and back down close to the trunk, there's a female cardinal. And they're there because if you look to the right, they're eating those berries. The Brazil tree will both bloom and fruit at the same time. One of the few trees that do that. Not only that, it'll do that off and on through its entire blooming fruiting season, which is about six months long. So it's really good. And it's way down the list of what deer want to eat. Will they never eat it? No, I would never say that. If you have a herd of at least 15 deer in your neighborhood, they're gonna eat anything except maybe rosemary. Um, but if you just have a small group, they're gonna wait until they are desperate before they think about uh, this plant. Because you see in the right picture where the berries are, you see those thorns coming off of it. And also those leaves are very aromatic and you don't like that. Now, why was it a confession for me to tell you that I want one of these and, and that's why I put this in here? Because I have been looking for a year for a commercial source for one, and I have not been able to find one, not even in Medina Gardens, which is my common go to and, and, and a wonderful place. So if also if any of you know of anywhere that sells these, I would be very much in your debt. And in the meantime, if you find one of these in your property, you are a lucky person. Texas persimmon. If you have oak, juniper, woodlands anywhere around you, there is Texas persimmon. It grows in the oak, juniper, woodlands. It grows slowly, but it grows. Not only that, this is among the most adaptable trees that there is. This will grow out of limestone. This little tree you see here is the one that's growing up and arching over in the center of the picture. Now you want a female tree. There are male trees and female trees and only the female trees bear fruit. So you want a female tree. And if there's any woodland around you within a five mile radius, you don't have to worry about a male tree. It'll, the pollen will float on the wind and it'll get fertilized. You just need the female tree for the berries, for the um, persimmons. And this one was growing out of a fissure in limestone. So it'll do that. It'll grow in clay. It'll grow in soil. It'll grow in full shade. It'll grow in full sun. It'll grow in drought. It'll grow in practically in a swamp. It's a really good tree. The only thing it won't do is grow fast. It will take a long time. Now, it will grow faster if you will compost it and in the really dry times, if you will water it, and of course you want to water in anything you plant anyway, and if you are planting in an inch of clay over limestone, you need to be treating your new trees 
like they are new trees three years after you've planted them because it takes a long time to get your little rootlets down into limestone. So that means you still give them water when they need it. And this is Yopan holly. This is the holly tree and it's the little small one at the front of the picture that goes straight up with a, a little almost spindle looking uh, trunk. That was the tree that the endangered golden chief warbler had her nest in. Um, and that's an evergreen tree. So it not only gives berries, not as many as possum haw, but in good years, years with rain, you'll get a lot of berries on it. Um, but it will also thicket. Now the way it thickets is not underground runners. What happens is it has berries and birds eat the berries and they poop the berries. And sometimes the berries just fall off. And if, if there is um, mulch around there or leaves around there, well, that's a pretty decent place to settle and they, they will germinate pretty readily. And so then more little trees will grow up. If you don't want to have to pull out possum haw hollies, well, maybe you need to be planting kind of more in, a, in rocks or in a rocky area. But it's a good tree for that. Moving on to bushes, agarita. Now, I would like to ask how many of you have agarita on your property? And if you will just respond in the chat and then at the end we'll talk about, we'll, um, I'm just curious because you're in an agarita area and um, unfortunately agarita is one of the things that gets developers and builders clear first thing because they don't like the prickles. But agarita is like a, a foolproof plant almost. You get um, deer don't eat it. It'll live in the hill country. It'll live under ash junipers. It'll live in the dry. It'll even live in full sun, although that's not its favorite. In the spring, there are those wonderful yellow flowers with the most heavenly scent. And then in years with enough rain, there are berries for the birds. Now, I know there are people who, who spread a cloth underneath and beat the bushes and drag the berries out to make jelly, but I want you to know they don't have that much flavor. You have to put a lot of sugar in it. And so what's the point? Let the birds have those. Buy yourself some good strawberries for your jelly. And don't we all need something for shade? If you have a big oak tree, you probably have shade. And in your shade, you might like to have some understory bushes. American Beauty is that bush. It will grow in dappled shade. Not only that, it will bloom and fruit. Look at those beautiful purple berries. And again, you have really pretty fall color. In most of the hill, in most of Texas, or, or at least most of central Texas, we don't have a lot of fall color. But we do have American Beauty Berry in our forest. And, and when the leaves fall off, those purple berries, if they haven't been eaten yet, will still stay. And they are gorgeous. And the bird in that picture is a, <clears throat> an, again, an American robin. But I had three kinds of orioles there in the year that there was an oriole incursion. Mockingbirds like them, cardinals will eat them, cedar wax wings will, will clean them off. Dwarf Barbados cherry. Now Dwarf Barbados cherry, um, I'm thinking is a good one to put on the south side of your house and kind of up against your house. Give it some protection from the winter wind. But if you can put it someplace, it will be deciduous in any winter with a lot of freezing. But if there's not a lot of freezing, uh, it will be fairly evergreen. However, they typically come back. The ones around New Braunfels all came back after snowmageddon. And you will have beautiful little 
pink flowers that all the little pollinators go to, and then you will have the little red berries. And in years with enough rain, this cycle will be repeated multiple times during the growing season. So off and on you'll have this. They're really pretty little plants. Will deer eat this? Yes, but again, it's not their favorite. So I would fence them uh, if I, if I, I would fence them. I did fence them eventually. And this is pigeon berry. Pigeon berry, you can grow in a pot on your porch. That plant was in that pot for 14 years. It's in the ground now, and so I'm taking bets on whether or not it's going to survive since I didn't plant it until the end of this October. We'll see. But pigeon berry is another one of those plants that blooms and fruits at the same time in the shade. And how many plants are there like that? Now, you want to know that it, it's toxic. Don't eat it. You don't want your dog to eat it. You don't want your grandkids to eat it. Um, will it kill you? I don't know. Depends on who you are and how much you eat. Uh, it didn't, I don't think, it, I haven't read anyone who thought it was palatable, but um, that's one thing you do need to know. And it is deciduous. It'll die back. Okay, so here we are shelter trees, and I am almost through Anacacho orchid tree. These trees are nearly evergreen and they're dense, so they're a good place for the birds to, to come and hide, and when they bloom in spring, it smells like vanilla. Oh my word, put them someplace where you can have an open window, and they attract all kinds of pollinators. Not only that, a lot of insects take shelter um, within little, little flying insects like gnats and things take shelter within them, even when they're not blooming, which makes them good for birds, for feeding. Evergreen sumac, the only, about the only thing you can do that you are guaranteed to kill evergreen sumac is water it too much. And don't we all need that when we live in the land of consistent and sometimes persistent droughts? They bloom in the spring and you probably need to fence it from deer. Texas mountain laurel and they're evergreen. Some of them get big, they're very slow growers. And you see those seed pods hanging down inside of those seed pods are those beautiful red seeds. And I've seen people make necklaces out of them, which is fine, but you don't want, any, you don't want your grandkids to eat them because those seeds are toxic also, although not as toxic as some of the other things. And they're really slow growing. And now large trees, cedar elm. The cedar elm is a fast growing large tree. It will not take you a long time before that tree significantly exceeds your height and does really well. Plant This is a good one to plant on the west side of your house because in the summer when it's so hot you will have shade for your house and the leaves will fall then and in the winter you will have sun when you need it. And in the spring there are thousands, although it might feel like millions, of seeds on the tree, and it will attract all kinds of birds. And then, a little later on, you will have thousands of seedlings if you planted that in a cultivated bed. So maybe think about planting it in a place where either deer graze and put a fence around it, because those seeds will, will fly off, and the deer will eat Deer won't bother a cedar elm necessarily on its own, uh, but when you first plant it, they will, um, but they will eat all the baby trees up, so you won't have a problem with them. Also, if you put it in the middle of a lawn, if you have a lawn that you mow, because you can just mow the trees, and then you, the baby trees, and then you won't have a problem with them. And our old friend, the live oak, and um, I just, the only thing I want to mention about this picture is um, if you can cover your tray feeder 
and tray feeders, remember, are what the ground birds like to feed on, then it'll be a better shelter for them to eat in inclement weather. And that one is full of sparrows on that wintry day. And sandpaper tree, also known as Anacua. Now, you won't see one that big in the hill country where the limestone is so close to the surface. They won't get that big. But they will grow and they will thrive. And they do have uh, fruit and flowers. And they are really pretty sturdy. And typically deer don't bother them to eat them, but they will buck rub them. So put a fence around it and it will also thicket. So if you don't like any of the other thicket opportunities, you can plant one of these. And the thicketing is by underground runners. And then the new tree pops up and it's really hard to pull. Guess how I know that? Okay, and for everyone who made it all the way through, in the middle top picture, there is a golden cheek, uh, sorry, there is an orange crowned warbler taking a bath and in the middle of his forehead, you can see that little orange blush, that's his orange crown. On the left is a uh, female Baltimore Oriole in Firebush. On the right is a female black chin hummingbird, and at the bottom is our old friend, the Roadrunner. And now I would love to answer any questions that you've got, and if you can put them in the chat, I'm gonna, um, oh, you don't want to see my chat here, do you? Okay. Put them in the chat. I'm going to pull this up. Oh, a lot of, a lot of folks have agarita. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thomas Collins has thousands of them on his ranch. I wish I had a few of yours. Nine. I think we had nine respondents for that. That's great. Did anybody have the Brazil tree? Didn't see any. Oh, okay. So are there any questions? We do have a question here. Any hints about finding the female Texas persimmon? Um, that's really hard. It, uh, and it, it's, um, not the most common in ordinary times, but now because of snowmageddon, it's really hard. I would, I would try um, Medina Gardens. I would try um, some of your other local nurseries there, the, the ones that specialize in natives. The only way you're going to know it's a female is if it's um, starting to get fruit. So the time for that, the time for buying it, would be uh, summerish, like June to July. If it's a big enough tree, you might even uh, might even still have some in August. Okay, well, that, that's good to know. Uh, we have another question. Uh, you mentioned compost. How and what do you use? Well, I make my own compost, but I don't make enough. So typically, I use whatever the best thing I can find is. I look for an organic compost. Um, I want it to be uh, friable, and I really like any compost that has mycorrhizal fungi in it because um, I am, uh, as I mentioned, we have sold and moved to a new house where there were no trees and no garden, nothing but blankety Bermuda grass. And so we've had to pull up 2,500 square feet of it and work it and plant gardens. And so it's all builder clay and we need a lot of help. But uh, so when you look at it, 
look to see what it's made of, look to see where it comes from, and look at the price. There are, are there's a range of different ones. Okay, is there some way, some place that you can get the, the mycorrhizae fungi that you mentioned? Uh, yeah, you can actual, actually buy mycorrhizal fungi on Amazon, which is what I did when I was planting. I just, it's pricey, and it's pricey for a good reason. You know that what mycorrhizal fungi is, is it's a little um, beneficial fungi that lives in healthy soil and attaches to roots of plants. And it helps to translate the nutrients in the soil, the minerals and nutrients, into a substance that the roots can uptake better. So it enables your plant to get more nutrition, faster, better, more completely. So having healthy soil is really important. Clay is often deficient in mycorrhizal fungi because it's so compacted. There's, there's no space in it or not a lot of space in it. And so there's not much aeration to it and the fungi really doesn't live there. And so you've got to break up the clay, which typically means uh, you pickaxe much bigger holes that you need for anything when you're planting and you mix a lot of compost and organic matter in a, along with the clay when you're planting. And then you start in all of the adjacent areas, you start applying good amounts of compost regularly. And the compost will break down, but it will also, um, it will also help to build up a healthy soil and the clay beneath it, because it is less likely to dry out, will begin to absorb some of that into it and that will affect the structure of the clay so that the clay will eventually be more friable. Oh, very good, thank you. Um, here's another question for you um, and our Viewer says, I attempt to deter the house sparrows and usually don't have them here in the country, but this winter they moved in and they're eating the thistle seed, chasing off the goldfinches. Um, the birdhouses all have small openings, so she's wondering what else she could do to discourage them. Oh man, that's tough. And I have never seen that. Those house sparrows must have been desperate. You know what you might could do? You might could take a feeder of mixed seed. They'll eat millet. They like millet, actually, uh, at some distance from your Niger feeder so that they congregate someplace else, you know, far corner of your yard, and you don't have to put the good stuff in there for them because I would be willing to bet that they would be more inclined to eat from a seed mix than to eat Niger. Is Niger the only thing you're feeding? I'll wait, see if we get a response. Um. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I have black oil sunflower seed and they were coming to that first. Yeah. And so I let that feeder go empty, thinking that they would leave, <laughs> and instead they went to the thistle feeder. <laughs> okay. But they love the black sunflower. Yes. Well, so take take your other some kind of feeder a distance away, and you can just put a seed mix in it. You don't have to use a, a complete black oil sunflower. And I bet they will leave the Niger alone then. Okay. I'll deter them to another area with the cheaper stuff. <laughs> so the good guys are on the good stuff. Gotcha. Yeah. And somebody okay. else in the chat also suggests that same thing, to feed only black oil and sunflower for a few days. Yeah, farther away. 
Ooh, and uh. Sandra said she has female Texas persimmon on her property and perhaps could look for smaller ones to dig up for anyone who's looking for them. So that's a good thing for the group to know. Oh, and someone else, Pam said native nurseries recommended plant house two for mycorrhizal fungi. That's great if you have a local source. I could not find one here. I'd have to drive to Austin. I wasn't willing to do that. Any more questions? Well, thank you all so much. And I would love to come back and talk to you about hummingbirds or deer resistant um, landscaping or small space habitat gardening. <laughs>